There was, um, it's mostly creative differences. Mm -hmm. um, Brenda came up with the idea of the project in 2004 and pitched it to Pixar and John mm -hmm. Lasseter. Mm -hmm. And they loved the idea of this um, parent-child uh, story, you know, at the heart, that it takes place in this medieval Scotland. They liked all those aspects. And then it went to the development phase, and they got the story going up to a certain point where they would start, uh, there was enough about it that seemed solid enough that you green it to go into production. So you start building the sets and the characters and everything and designing and getting ready to be animated. And then at a certain point, they had been working on what we do, uh, the process, is we build the story in story reels. We do the whole movie and look at it and go, this movie isn't any good. And we take it down and try it again and change elements around because the story is really alchemy, <coughs> right? It's really hard. And we're trying to change lead into gold. We're trying to find all those, out of all the potentials, what are the right directions to go with the characters and with the themes so that they all line up and tell this really great story. So Brave was running into story trouble. Um, and at the 18-month deadline, where you only have a year and a half left to make the movie before it comes out, something's got to happen. Um, we couldn't push back the deadline anymore. Um, they had already kind of done it a couple times already. Um, so something has to happen. So Pixar approached me to take over for Brenda to have that director change. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but it happens. And it's all done for the best of the story to get that story where it needs to be. And we did it on Ratatouille. We did it on Toy Story 2. Um, it's done in Hollywood and all the animation studios. Uh, it happens all the time in live action. It's just when you get stuck, you need to have that kind of change. So I came on board. I said, of course. I kind of been loosely on the project since the beginning as the outside kind of consultant on all things medieval Scottish and Celtic <laughs> myth from the get-go. I mean, their first books, research books, were all, came out of my library. They're all my books. So a lot of this had, had kind of already been in my wheelhouse. I would have done a middle age fantasy, you know, medieval fantasy film already that had magic in it and, you know, monsters and you know, action and stuff. So, and I also very good friends with Brenda. So I want to do right by Brenda, do right by her story because the bones of the story were fine. It was just getting that, you know, having everything fall in line and, and, and get in sync. Was, was she happy with the outcome? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. No, she, yeah, she loves it. Good. She loves it. She loves it. I was curious about mm -hmm. the portrayal of men mm -hmm. in the film and was somewhat surprised that they came they come across mostly as bumbling, as doofuses. Mm -hmm. how, how did that happen? That um, Well, that's an interesting question that I haven't got yet. Uh, it wasn't our intent to, I mean, when they're going after that bear, there's nothing bumbling or doofus to see about them. And, you know, there's a, there's a theme of duality that's in every aspect of the film. In the, title, it's a, in the title itself, in with the characters, every single character has a moment of duality. Every single scene and moment has a moment of duality because there's two sides to everything. And with men... There's the two sides to us. There is our bumbling, childlike things. My wife razzes me about it all the time. You know, why can't you be more, you know, why are you just, you know. Um, but then when we're focused and we're going after, you know, something, there's that aspect of us too. So with all the lords, with, the, with King Fergus, with the triplets, Everything there is a there is that duality of that childlike playful humor, but then when they're going after that bear, things get serious. They're locked in on it, and there's nothing bumbling about. Them. We're really taking a, a, you know as an authentic, real, relatable approach as we can, instead of carving out these archetypes that are superficial. You know, I don't want to do that as a, as a storyteller. I want to get in. I have the chance when I'm telling a story to to get to the heart of the matter and give me and give the audience relatable characters, you know, and and that's what I'm going to to try. And and that awkwardness do. of when you're a teen, anyway, everybody. It's all awkward. It's all. Awkward. <laughs> I was totally that middle guy who was all cocky and it was you know slap fighting. <laughs> that was totally me. There was nothing to it. You know? Well, there's also a darkness of the story. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, the the yes. husband is going to kill the wife. Yes. The daughter kind of. Uh, 
relinquishes any blame she has for putting the spell on her mom. Yes. Say, hey, right. it was the witch's fault. Right. You yeah, know? Right. And was was there uh, was the there end. somebody reeling you in saying that we're getting a little too dark here? We need to pull it back. No, no. That's one thing that uh, the great thing about Pixar is is that they continue to push. You know, and when John saw this and we were getting dark, he's all, "It's fine." It's fine because it serves the purpose of the story. It raises the stakes of this tale. I can't go into a, a, a telling a story and pretend there are stakes, pretend there's a lesson to be learned if there's not really real consequences. You know, it's like it's why we in The Incredibles hurt um, Bob when he's fighting with the with the big robot to go. Oh my gosh, <coughs> people could actually get hurt. You know, there's there's there's. There's consequences. And with this, for the focus of the story, which is this trans, you know, this transformation from child to adult that Meredith is going through in the teenage years, she needs to realize, oh my God, I just made a mistake that's going to off my mother, right? I gotta fix this. And that takes some huge you know, things from her to, you know, her father's got to get mom there because he thinks it's a bear. You know, he doesn't believe him. And we have to, and the whole more do tale is the dark tale that is her exact story gone bad, you know, that I'm playing against as well, you know. So you're in good hands, though, too. It, we could have easily gone PG-13 with the violence and the level of the scariness. But we knew that we want to get a whole audience. So it had to be properly scary, you know, so that we just get into those thrills and then bounce it right back out with the humor and the action and, and the heart. And I think we've really done a good job in balancing all those aspects so that you feel, actually feel scared or feel for these characters that are in the mover or else it's just, again, it's just superficial uh, cliche fluff, you know, and it's intellectual instead of a hard balance, you know. Um, and one reason that we started off the movie was seeing Merida as a child, uh, even a smaller child. Um, it was something that that came out of my experience with my kids, is that only in play do the hierarchies of this relationship vanish. When I'm playing with my kids, I'm not dad, right? I'm just an, another playmate, right? We're, mm-hmm. we're totally equal. I'm not instructing them how to play or telling them what to do or looking out for them. We're just playing and having a good time. We're enjoying each other, right? And that's when bond really forms. And this works for anybody, not just parent and child, but it works for anybody, your friends or whatnot. It's we get together and we, we play, you know? And then there is no hierarchy, hierarchy in life. So I thought that was really important to show that so that when you go forward and now here she is a teenager and their relationship is fractured, that the only way to get it back was to change the dynamic of that relationship, i.e. take them out of the queen, daughter, princess, whatever roles yeah. and stick them back into play, in which is water. what they do in the water. Yeah. And then they're playing again and just enjoying each other and there is no mom daughter, queen, princess, there's no duty or role, and now you could sit back and look at this person and accept them for who they really are and what they really mean to you, and that's when, in the movie, that process of healing starts. And then from there you go, now I have to reconsider on both sides, both characters had to reconsider how they were approaching this relationship. It's making a movie, I mean, I'm glad I've had the live action experience and the animation experience because there's a lot of things that are similar in both, but the process of animation is you're making a movie in slow motion because I don't have any context to work with. Right now we've got the light, we've got everybody's wearing clothes, we've got this, the devices, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to work with that I can change the context by just standing up, right? And I can see how it, it will work, right? In animation, I have to design this room, design everybody, da da da, sit everybody down to build the context to then look at it and then decide that doesn't work. Let's stand somebody up and see what happens. Well, that means all this other stuff has to fall into place. So working with the actors, I don't have them in the same room doing the chemistry off of each other. I have to build that performance later. So I have to get them to read the lines in very subtle, different ways 
a lot of different ways so I have coverage to go back and when I'm putting Kelly McDonald and Emma Thompson together in editorial I can see that oh Emma went up here and that's great but Kelly didn't do we have one where Kelly kind of goes up to kind of match the ferocity da, da, da. yes we got one or no we don't okay next time we go record Kelly I'm going to get her to go there and back that up so it's moving at a snail's pace in this very plotting <laughs> bit more, by bit more thing. Challenging, it's, really, animated. it's more challenging because I'm more used to two things happen as you want the instantaneous you want to get to the answer fast and animation you never get to it fast you get to it slow so I'm like you know is, is this right is this right is this right I got people on the clock doing stuff I don't want to waste their time right um, and the other thing that happens is that you don't get the happy accidents. Every happy accident that seems organic in there is totally manufactured to seem like a happy accident. And I'm looking for any chance to do that. So if there's a gack in the line or it's, they choke the word or, or the animator does something and there's a weird wig out, I'm all, da, 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 keep it, keep it, keep it, just polish it. It's, it's good to go. We have the cameras bounce and hitch, you know, because the... The, the, the lines aren't smooth. I'm all, leave it in, leave it in. You know, if it goes out of focus, it doesn't fall focus, leave it in, because we can have perfection in animation. But movies are not about perfection. Mm -hmm. Movies are about imperfection, and I have to stick it all in, so that's really, really challenging.